Good evening, folks. I'm Stephen Lee. For those of you that haven't met me yet, I have the privilege of serving as president of Iowa State University, a job I truly love. Um, tonight, I want to welcome you uh, to a special lecture in biosciences by Juan Enriquez. Uh, a colleague of mine is going to formally introduce him in a few minutes. So what I'd like to do with my time up here is recognize a major sponsor of tonight's lecture, that is the Iowa Farm Bureau. I'll start by saying some months ago, Craig Hill told me about tonight's speaker. And after I listened, I went home and learned about him, talked about him on campus, and found out there's great interest in having Mr. Enriquez here and in having a whole series on biosciences as our evening lecture series. Um, what was also clear is that we wanted to share these opportunities with other folks, not just the Iowa State community, but people in the surrounding area. And uh, one group in particular is the Farm Bureau. They were back at the top of my list, partly because of our relationship with Farm Bureau and partly because of Craig giving us this idea. So joining me in a few minutes up here is going to be Craig Hill, president of the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation. Farm Bureau is a generous sponsor of tonight's lecture. But before I turn the podium over to Craig, I want to say a few things about him. Don't be nervous. <laughs> um, Craig's service to Farm Bureau started many, many years ago. I won't tell you exactly how many, but he started at the county level. He was heavily involved with Warren County Farm Bureau Board of Directors, and in 1989 was elected district rep to the state board. Craig then served as vice president of the state organization from 2001 to 2011, and then was elected president of Iowa Farm Bureau. As president, he serves as chairman of FBL Financial Group and sits on the American Farm Bureau Board of Directors. He also serves on the board of Rain and Hale LLC. Craig and his wife, Patty, who is with him here tonight, have two children and continue to operate their family grain and livestock operation near Milo, Iowa. I must say, what impressed me about meeting Craig when I first moved to Iowa was his total commitment and dedication to agriculture in this state to crop and livestock producers in this state, and really across the whole nation. He is a dedicated servant of agriculture. He has been involved in countless projects to benefit farm families in the, in the agriculture industry, from crop insurance to policy development to planning Iowa's future in the ag biosciences. And it probably doesn't need any introduction to you folks, but I'm going to say Craig and Farm Bureau have also been fantastic partners to Iowa State University. We collaborate on a long range, a long list of things, everything from student scholarships to research programs, and we work very closely with our county level organizations and our extension and outreach programs. So Craig, please come up here to the lecture podium, and at the, while he's doing that, I'd like to acknowledge the Committee on Lectures, funded by the government of the student body, for their support of tonight's events and the great job they do throughout the year. So let's welcome Craig. Thank you for that very flattering introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to serve as president of the Iowa Farm Bureau. But I'm an Iowan, and I'm a farmer. And as you know, farmers have been practicing agriculture for, or the biological sciences, for some 10,000 years. We engage in this practice to sustain not only our lives, but the lives of others. We've always worked to, to breed animals and plants for improvement. Our tools have evolved over time, and discovery has led to dramatic change over those 10,000 years. But consider for a moment the past 150 years. And I've chosen 150 years because that's pretty much when Iowa first started to become settled. It's also the birth date of George Washington Carver, the first black faculty here at Iowa State University. Henry A. Wallace, another name, another Iowan that you'll recognize. Norman Borlaug, who's attributed to saving over a billion lives, a billion souls, according to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. So these are Iowans. And you couple this productivity and this level of innovation with the soils that we have here in Iowa, with the land-grant institutions, with the outreach and education and, and extension of that education to farmers and the farmers in Iowa. When you put that all together, I would make the claim that there is not a geographic space anywhere on the globe 
that matches Iowa for having a profound effect on people's lives and sustaining life around the world. So that is our history. And to speak about our future, I've invited Juan Enriquez here to visit with you tonight. He is one of those unique individuals who lives in the future and works on the cutting edge of discovery. He's an active investor in early stage private companies in the life sciences sector and is one of the world's leading authorities on uses and benefits of genomic research. Bioscience is beginning to affect the way we live, the way we work, the way we do business, and Juan is an articulate and effective advocate of its promise. He is co-founder of Synthetic Genomics, a company developing breakthrough genomic-driven solutions for ma major global issues. Synthetic Genomics was a partner and a major funder of J. Craig Venner's Institute. The creation of the first synthetic bacterial cell from that investment. He is the author of a global bestseller, As the Future Catches You, an analysis of the impact of genomics on business and society, The Untied, and I pronounce that correctly, The Untied United States of America, which explores why, as technology advances, some countries are successful while others disappear. Mr. Onwikwes is a managing editor of Excel Venture Management, and we are very honored and excited to have him here with us today. Please give a warm welcome to Juan Enriquez. Thank you, sir. All right. So I know you're all just dying for a lecture on genes. But as you're thinking about that, just keep an open mind because we're going to touch some pretty strange stuff and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. And as you think about financial crises and what they do to societies and how societies get upended by banks going broke or by Wall Street or whatever, you often focus on the daily NASDAQ or Dow or whatever or whether a company goes out of business or not. And, and you often lose sight of a much bigger wave, which is this wave of technology. And, and these waves of technology aren't always apparent. They don't always announce themselves. There isn't a clear stock index for them. They don't happen from one day to the next. But their overall impact is much larger than any kind of financial crisis. So let me talk to you about these waves of technologies through three pretty simple ideas. The first idea is all wealth in the world comes from code. So what does that mean? That means that you've got about 3.2 billion letters of gene code in each of your cells. So each of your cells is a hard drive that has 3.2 billion bits in it. And the difference between a man and a mouse is about 5% of gene code. And most of our wives already know that. <laughs> and as you're thinking about that, the real difference between ourselves and a monkey is about 1.2% of gene code. But the thing that we do that no other animal does is we transmit data across time. We teach stuff. So if you learned something 10,000 years ago, if you learned something 1,000 years ago, if you learned something 100 years ago, we are able to actually teach that, and you don't have to learn it from scratch. There is no animal other than a human being that will do something like this on a cave wall. And why is this stuff so important? Because it's beginning to tell you. This is the kind of fish we eat. This is how we cook it. These are the musical instruments we play. This is how many of us there are. This is how we dress. These are our customs. And of course, you just learned a lot about what was going on in Argentina 2,000 years ago. And there's no other animal that can teach you what they were doing 2,000 years ago other than a human being. Now, as code keeps changing, what ends up happening is you standardize code so you can read in Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt the same perfectly innocent sentence that says Red Sox rule, just to pick a random sentence. And what you're doing is when you put that on papyrus or when you put it on clay tablets, you don't have to go to the cave wall to learn. So all of a sudden you can transmit data across vast distances and you can have an empire instead of a tribe. All of a sudden you can have textbooks, you can have holy books, you can have customs bills, you can have comic books, you can have all kinds of stories because you can pick up a piece of paper from here and move it over to there, which you can't do with cave wall hieroglyphs. Then, of course, you standardize that into 26 letters. You put it in movable type, and you have libraries the size of this building, accumulating what you've learned over hundreds and thousands of years. 
This is what we learned about history. This is what we learned about agriculture. This is what we learned about cattle. This is what we learned about corn. And all that stuff gets transmitted across time until people invent a truly stupid machine. So this machine was so dumb that it could not understand 26 letters. It could only understand current, no current, light, no light, one, zero. So that's the world's first transistor that led to a Nobel Prize. And because it could only speak in two letters, you had to change the alphabet. So you didn't write in hieroglyphs, you didn't write in ABCs, you began to write in ones and zeros. And what you've done is you've collapsed every word written and spoken in English into two letters. So if I send you the first line of code here, you will get a message that says, I love you. If I send you the second line of code, you pick up your iPhone or your cell phone and it says, I hate you. Believe me, the function is going to change depending on which message you send. Because the difference between love and hate is green or purple. Not only have you collapsed every word written and spoken in English into two letters, you've collapsed every language and every alphabet in the planet into two letters. So every word in Chinese, Japanese, Cyrillic, Aramaic, Egyptian, French, German, is no longer in tens of thousands of kanjis, is no longer in 29 letters in Spanish, is no longer in 26 letters in English. It's all coded in digital letters. And oh, by the way, you've also coded into digital letters every bit of music. You no longer need vinyl records. So you're storing every bit of music in the same alphabet. And you're storing every photograph and every video and every film. That means you don't need to build libraries the size of this building because you're carrying those libraries around in a little small pocket device. That completely changes the world. That has been the source of most jobs for the last 30 years. That's been the source of most economic growth for the last 30 years. You want to figure out which areas have been growing really quickly? It's the areas that speak this stuff. Now, as this stuff is so powerful, why weren't people using it? Because this is five megabytes in 1956. Let me put that in context. Take a single photograph with your cell phone. You just used up the entire computer. And it only cost you a million bucks. So not surprisingly, there was not a lot of digital photography in 1956. And in 1957, it was two photographs for 500,000 bucks. And in 1958, it was four photographs for 125,000 bucks. And how much did your last thousand photographs cost all of you? So it doesn't look like it's moving, it doesn't look like it's moving, it doesn't look like it's moving, and then you get a hockey stick at the end of it in these doubling progressions. So it doesn't look like you're changing alphabets. It doesn't look like you're changing stuff. And then it really does change from this into the stuff you've got in your pocket to the point where the world's most powerful computer in 1996, the first one that did a trillion floating point operations per second, is now inside your computer chip, inside your PC, with about 2.2 billion transistors. And you move from that single, lonely, silly transistor into 2.2 billion of these things inside this thing. And basically, you're carrying around more power, data, information than the President of the United States did 20 years ago. When you think of the access he had to biographies, to maps, to data, to books, to information, you're carrying more of that than the most powerful person on the planet. And this shifts businesses in really big ways. So in 1986, about, oh, 6% of the world was digital. Today, it's about 99%. And you've completely unended who's rich and who's poor based on who learned this and who didn't learn this stuff. This is the rise of Malaysia. This is the rise of Taiwan. This is the rise of Bangalore. A whole series of places that you would not have bet on. And by the way, it's the source of jobs. Because most job growth in the United States comes from startups. You want to understand the big difference between what's happening in Europe today and what's happening in the United States? It's very easy to do. Think quickly in your mind five large US companies that didn't exist one, two, or three decades ago. 
And you're all going to come up with five or ten of them, right? So there's Microsoft and Google and Yahoo and Instagram and Zynga and all these things. Now think in your own minds the names of three or five European companies that didn't exist a couple of decades ago. Now that's a little harder. Some of them exist, but it's not as common to have these startups that become very large companies quickly, that become global companies. And by the way, for the last 10 years, the top 10 job grid generating industries all have to do with this digital code. So where are the jobs? Where is the growth? Where does it come from? It comes from this transition in language and code. Why is that relevant to all of you? Because you're ground zero for the next transition. If there's any place that's living this, that's going to see it before the rest of the world, that's going to apply it before the rest of the world, it's right here. Because we're moving from digital code to life code. And as you begin to think of the implications of that, if you thought the digital revolution was fast, the life code revolution is going to be faster. And again, it doesn't look like much. Right? Remember that little transistor? Well, here's what the transistor looks like after Mendel's P's. It looks like that little model of a double helix. So what's the argument that Watson and Crick were making? They discover this thing called a double helix, and they begin to argue all life forms on this planet are coded into DNA. So it's like a spiral staircase, and it's got four little letters on it, adenine, theanine, guanine, cytosine. So in essence, what they're saying is instead of writing out life as 26 letters or as two letters, you can write it out as four letters. That's a really aggressive argument because it's making the argument that every cattle, pig, sheep, banana, cantaloupe, orange, human being, and politician are all made of the same stuff. And as you begin to think about that and the implications of that, it means you can write unbelievably boring books by doing gene sequencing. So you stick the stuff inside machines and you put out billions of letters of code. And what that does is it makes this orange a computer. But it's a life computer, it's not a digital computer. And how does this thing work? Well, it sits on a tree minding its own business till one day it does that. And when it does that, it begins to execute code. What does that code say? It says something like this, and it says A-A-T-C-A-H-G, which translates into make a little root. T-G-C-A, make a little stem. G-T-C-A, make a couple of leaves. A-G-G-G, make some flowers. G-A-C-C-C, now make a couple more oranges. And as you think about that, remember those little ones and zeros? One, zero, one, 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 I love you. Zero, one, 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 I hate you. The order of those ones and zeros really matters to the outcome. Same thing with this. Maybe you change C-A-G-G -G instead of A-A-C, and this becomes a tangerine. Or maybe you say C-G-G-G-A, and it becomes a lemon. Or it begins to make something else, like a vaccine. So as you're thinking about life code, the difference between each of you is about one in every thousand letters between you and the person sitting next to you. And as you're thinking of this structure, that means that life is code. And what does it mean for life to be code? It means that code, like a book, well, you can read the whole book. You can read a chapter in the book. You can read a paragraph in the book. You can photocopy the book. You can edit the book. If life is code, you can do the same things with life. What does that mean? Well, basically that means you can go over to Argentina, meet these really nice scientists, and they will introduce you to their pet cow. Really nice pet cow. Very friendly. As you're petting the cow, these two guys show up. And you think, wow, those two look really similar. And in fact, they look really similar to that one. Well, the reason why is because each of the cells in the cow, just like each of your cells, contains the entire gene code of a cow, the entire genome of a cow, which means you can take some cells from the ear of this cow, insert them into fertilized cow's ovum, and give birth to two clones. 
So you can photocopy life. This is what cloning looks like. Vet, left hand way up the back of the cow, placing cloned embryos in the morning I took these pictures, which is why there are a lot of cows walking the Argentine pampas that look really similar. And as you're thinking about that, that means you can read life code, and it means you can copy life code. Third stage looks like this. This animal was born a few weeks after I took these pictures. Why is this animal interesting? Because they edited the life code in this animal in such a way that it uses a medicine used to treat cancer in its milk. So every time you milk this animal, it produces erythropoietin, EPO. 20 of these cows substitute for that factory. How we make things and where we make things is going to change on an absolutely fundamental basis. And again, you're at ground zero of where this could happen. Because bacteria, algae, plants, animals are becoming factories that can make a lot of stuff. But of course, Americans would never agree to be treated with a medicine made in Argentine cloned cow's milk. That's why Americans are using goats. <laughs> These guys live in western Massachusetts. They're making a medicine that was put for approval before the FDA. And each of these little things is worth about a million bucks. So which farmers are going to be richer? The ones who are making wonderful organic goat cheese? Or the ones who are making medicines? Or materials? Or other structures? And as you think about being able to code life, you don't have to execute the entire code. You don't have to make the entire animal. You can pick up a book and read a chapter in a book. You can read a paragraph in a book. You can take the mouse genome and just make mice teeth. So don't execute the entire program, make me a mouse. Don't make the mouse legs. Don't make the mouse stomach. Just make the mice teeth. And by the way, build it in a petri dish. And of course, if you can do that with mice, then if you go to the Harvard School of Dentistry, you can do that with human teeth. This sounds really strange until you understand where teeth come from. You are all born without teeth. Your mothers were very grateful. Then you grew a full set of teeth. Then you gave away those teeth to the tooth fairy. Tooth fairy left a quarter. Then you grew another set of teeth. But the problem is if you lose part of that second set of teeth, they don't regrow unless if you become lawyers. Only lawyers and sharks have extra teeth. Right? You only get two sets. But you know what? You already know how to make teeth. You already did it once. You already did it twice. That code is in each of your cells. There's no reason why your body can't make a third set of teeth. And of course, if it can make a third set of teeth, there's no reason why it can't build an ear. Because you've done that twice already. And there's no reason why it can't build a bladder. And in fact, both of these things have been put into humans already. There's no reason why you can't rebuild a trachea. The first trachea transplant was a Colombian woman who was dying of tuberculosis in Spain, Mrs. Castilla. Now she's walking up and down five flights of stairs without a problem because they took the cartilage of a donor, put her own cells on it, and regrew her trachea. So this is stuff that's happening, and it's happening quickly. And as you think of the implications of this stuff, we're beginning to think about how do we start to print various organs. This is work by Tony Atala at Wake Forest. This in the previous four slides. So what, what's happening here, and why is this interesting? Because you can take a Hewlett Packard printer, you can take the four colors out of those little cartridges that are so expensive, you can put in cells and begin to print stuff. And the first thing they started to print was skin. 
The other interesting thing they did is they began to put a laser in front of where the printer head goes. So the printer head goes back and forth like this as it's printing. Why a laser? Because when you get burned, the burn has different, different depths. So there's places where you want cells for a third degree burn. There are places where you want cells for a second degree burn. There are places where you want cells of first degree burn. And what you're doing is you're simply going back and forth and putting the right cells inside there and regrowing skin for people who are burn victims. What does that mean for things like agriculture? Well, it means right now there is no way that you would think about using this for various agricultural products. But the cost on this stuff keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, and one of these days it's going to be cheap to make human skin. That means it's going to be cheap to make ostrich skin, crocodile skin, cow skin in the highest possible quality without having to grow the animal for three or four years, without having to worry about barbed wire, without having to worry about drought, without having to worry about anything else. You want to make a leather jacket? You want to make a leather belt? Well, just grow the skin instead of growing the whole animal. You want to be really cute about it, make the petri dish in the shape of the shoe so you don't even have to cut it. So as these technologies move forward, they affect design, they affect production in a whole series of interesting ways. This is now catalog order. Just in case some of you don't have the latest Harvard Biosciences Regenerative Medicine catalog in your bathroom, here's a couple of pages from the catalog. You can now order your little bioreactor to make hollow organs, bronchia, trachea, and blood vessels at home. Or if you want to be a little more sophisticated, you can build a little machine that keeps beating mice hearts alive. This is really useful around Halloween. <laughs> There's nothing quite like a live beating mouse heart to scare kids in the neighborhood. It works. And as you're thinking about this stuff, why does this change business? It changes business because it changes how you make things and where you make stuff. You can now program animals. You can program plants. You can program bacteria. You can program algae to make stuff. This is bacteria where about 80% or 90% of the body weight of the bacteria is a biodegradable plastic. A small startup called DuPont is using this stuff. So DuPont got tired of the price of oil yo-yoing. It sold nylon, polyester, rayon, all petrochemical derivatives to the Saudi Arabians. And it built what looks like a giant beer factory in Tennessee. And inside that beer factory, there's a whole bunch of little bacteria that look like this that make all of your breathable, stretchable jogging wear, all of your carpets, all of your new biomaterials. And by the way, that is now about 50% of DuPont's earnings. So it has moved from being a chemical company to a life science company. And as you think about transformations like that, that transformation is taking place at the ASF, where you also have research on bio, bioenzymes and all these kinds of things. It's happening at DSM. It has moved from coal to fertilizers to petrochemicals to performance materials now to life science projects and biologics. And if you don't evolve in this way, you're not competitive. This is moving into the food system. So as you think about jobs, Nestle is out there and is hiring people who know biomarkers and DNA and mRNA and proteins and metabolites, because these are the basic inputs for cosmetics as well as food. And it's the basic inputs for a whole series of anti-aging ingredients. And these are big companies. These are not little startups in the People's Republic of Cambridge that are beginning to move in how you make things with life sciences. Some really unexpected companies like Toyota are now in the agricultural field. Why is Toyota in the agricultural field? Because it is using plants or bacteria to grow about 60% of what goes on inside their cars in terms of plastics. 
And as this goes forward, you're beginning to see some unlikely entrants. So you're beginning to see General Electric sitting out there putting out ads that are talking about people's health and people's genomes. These aren't just wind turbines. These aren't just jet engines. These aren't just light bulbs. This is one of the largest companies in the world moving to execute on life code. And by the way, healthcare and life sciences is now about 14% of General Electric's total earnings. Which is why as you go through this, you see a genomic area, protein area, cell discovery area, bioprocess area, all at General Electric. Who do they hire? What startups do they buy? It's people literate in the languages that are being taught and executed in places like this. Because you are at the forefront of understanding insects, of understanding plant diseases, of understanding bacteria, of understanding fungi, of understanding animals. And you're seeing it often before the rest of the world sees it. Because if you get it wrong, the citrus disappears, or the cows get sick, or the pigs don't grow. So that language is a language that you speak, have been speaking with a degree of excellence for a long time. This all sounds very esoteric. Let me land it with a couple of very specific examples of how agriculture might change. I want you to take these examples with a great big grain of salt because one of the things that I do is I'm a venture capitalist, so I invest in startups that I think can grow to be very large. So these are two things that I've gotten interested in, or three things that I've gotten interested in. So discount. So the first one starts after a couple of beers with these two guys. And we're sitting in an Italian bar outside of DC. The guy who is standing there is the guy who sequenced the human genome, Craig Venter. The guy who's sitting is the guy who won the Nobel for Restriction Enzymes, Ham Smith. There was, of course, a lawyer there, happened to be a very nice lawyer, and myself. And the question we had is, could we ever build a cell that would be programmable that could make whatever we wanted it to make? So let me step back for a second. When Intel started making computer chips, it made computer chips that weren't specific to, there isn't a chip in your computer that says process the photographs. There isn't a chip in your computer that says process the YouTube video. There isn't a chip that says process the spreadsheet. There isn't a chip that says process the love letter, right? Everything runs through your chip in a single language. It's ones and zeros, and that chip doesn't care what you're doing, as long as it's in ones and zeros. It would be very cool if you could take a cell and program a cell from scratch. So we founded a company. And about four years and a mere 30 million bucks later, we were able to take this picture. Why is this picture interesting? Because it's the first time that you take the genes out of a cell and completely program a cell from scratch. That's not making life from scratch, because you're using an existing cell, but you are completely reprogramming the cell. So it's the equivalent of you have a Volkswagen in your garage, I come at night, I put a Maserati engine into the Volkswagen, you come back the next morning and every part of that car is a Maserati. You didn't make the car from scratch, but it changed. Which is why you saw covers that look like this across 4,800 science magazines, newspapers, et cetera. And I think it's the first science story where both the Vatican and the President of the United States have come out within 24 hours and said, yeah, that's okay. We're okay with this. Which took about three years of lobbying. Because before you do something like that, you go to every major religion in the world and you tell them, this is what we're going to do. Are you okay with this? Can we study this together? You go to every major security agency and you say, this is what we're doing. Here are the controls we're putting in place. You go to the USDA, you go to every major think tank and you say, this is what we are going to do. Let's chat about it. You don't just spring something like that on the world. But once you're able to do that, then you're able to program cells. 
And then you're beginning to ask yourself the question, not can I make a cell that is programmable? You're beginning to ask the question, can I do it efficiently enough that it's economic? And what could I make in a programmable cell? And that's where you start seeing these little beakers, because you make different things in each of these little things. And here's a cool part. This software makes its own hardware. No matter how I program a computer, I will not have a thousand computers in the morning. But if I program cells, then I can make a billion cells. And that's a big deal because that means this stuff scales. For all the academics out there who have publishing envy. Here's a question. What is the most published book in all editions, in all language, across all history? Some people might say it's the Bible. In a different part of the world, some people might say it's the Quran. In New York City, maybe people would say it's Fifty Shades of Grey. And the answer is none of the above. The most published book in all editions across all history is a book by this man, Harvard academic called George Church, who published this book about synthetic biology two years ago. There have never been more copies of any book published across history. Why? Because one of the things he did is he programmed this book into ATCGs and put it into a bacteria. And came back a couple of weeks later and he had two billion copies of his book. And then went on Stephen Colbert's show with something about the size of a little dot and gave 20 million copies to Stephen Colbert who promptly ate it. So you can carry a library, a very, very, very large library in a tiny little drop of water. Because the information storage capacity that you have in your genome or in a bacteria is really big. So one thing you can do with a programmable cell is you can store information. But that's kind of a minor use. What you can do is you can also scale this. So this is a greenhouse we built in La Jolla, California. And these little ponds are growing algae. And once the algae grows, then you put it into the back part of the greenhouse that looks like this. And then you come back a couple days later, and it looks like that, just like corn. Then what you do is you build some bigger ponds in central California that look like that. And we bought a big enough piece of land that we, we are going to build looks like that. And what you're doing is you're taking sunlight and CO2 and programmable algae and making stuff on a big scale. And what we did is we went and looked for little startups that might want to partner with us. We had 42 people. We found a nifty little startup in Texas called ExxonMobil. And they were nice enough to say, if you are able to meet the following milestones, we will give you $600 million to make algae out of fuel. And we thought, yeah, that's kind of interesting, so let's make fuel. And then we went to British Petroleum. And they wanted to break down long-chain hydrocarbons. All right, fair enough. Now we've got a second partner for programming. Then we went to Monsanto. Monsanto said, no, we don't want to partner with you. We want to buy a piece of your technology. So they bought 1% of the company for a very substantial sum. Just a little salami slice. Then we went to Novartis and started making vaccines. And instead of using tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of eggs to make vaccines over the course of a year. We can make these things over the course of days. Here's what's happening to the cost of producing this stuff. The cost per sequence of base pairs, the cost of assembling genes, the cost of producing oligos, wildly expensive, right? Who in the world would think of making 
this when it costs 10,000 or 100,000 times more than what we do today. And that's why it's important you go back to that photograph example where one digital photograph filled up that entire machine for a million bucks. And the next year it still wasn't cheap. And the next year it still wasn't cheap. But then it became the dominant system and Kodak was out of business. And what we're doing with this stuff is we are building machines that automate this process for people who want to program on our platform. So think of us as an iPhone and we want a whole series of app developers on it. And as you begin to automate and structure this, let's come back to agriculture again. Why might this be relevant to agriculture? Because right now, soy and wheat and barley, et cetera, are the major world crops. But why should you pay attention to algae? Because the output of algae in oil and protein for soybean is there on the bottom right. For corn is right there for sugarcane. Algae's on the left. How much protein and how much oil you can theoretically get per hectare is very different in algae than it is in other things. Now, there's a whole series of technical barriers to getting there. There's titer, there's production, there's getting the stuff out, there's programming the algae, but the amount of protein and oil that you can get out of algae is a different order of magnitude from what you can get out of acres and acres of soy. And the productivity that we are now getting inside this company in terms of titer and output is doing pretty well. This is not moving slowly. So what we are thinking of doing is using our cell factory as far as agriculture is concerned to move into fuels, oligochemicals, base proteins, aquafeeds, vegetable proteins, dairy proteins, nutritional oil ingredients, and carotenoids. We have not announced it yet, but you will see a very large food partnership sometime this year to begin to apply this stuff to things like basic feed production. And the interesting thing about agriculture, the interesting thing about a place like this, there is no place that consistently adopts technology faster than all of you. Remember those internet curves where people were just staggered? Oh my goodness, did you see how fast the iPhone got into everybody's hands? Okay, well you were doing that back in the 1930s. Because this is what the adoption rates look like for hybrid corn. And basically between 1936 and 1945, game over. Right? Almost everybody had it. And then you go and you look at nitrogen, or you look at GM maize, and what you're starting to see is these S adoption curves that take place in agriculture, where once the technology is established and once the lead farmers say, yes, go, this place knows how to use technology. This is a very smart part of the planet. It knows how to make stuff, it knows how to fix stuff, it sees breakthroughs in agriculture, it sees breakthroughs in applied machinery, it sees breakthroughs in climate, it sees breakthroughs in a whole series of things, and it applies it faster and has been doing so consistently for a long time. And that's good, because this is fast. Here's what's happened to the cost of sequencing. Between 2007 and 2011, the cost went from 9 million bucks per human genome to 10,000 bucks. That's a decline factor of 800 times during a period where computing fell by four times. This is happening 50% faster than we can build computers to store the data we're generating. Part of what's driving the global cloud, it's the data coming out of life sciences, finance, and astronomy. Which again, makes it absolutely essential for you to have a really top-notch bioinformatics computing department right next to the ag department right next to the breeding department, right next to the mechanical department, right next to the technology adoption integration area. Last example. Some of these changes are going, going to come very fast. Right now it takes about a week between the time that you send out a sample for something, like a blood test, because you may have something in your blood, 
or a food contaminated sample in time you get it back. You can now get the answer in about five hours in an automated fashion. And that is going to change the food business because not only do you get an answer, there is salmonella in here, but you get the answer, oh, by the way, the strain specifically comes out of this stuff. It is tied to this outbreak, or it is a new variant. So these strains become as distinguishable as fingerprints. And as this stuff begins to spread, you're not going to just say you've got salmonella on your chicken or your egg. You're going to say you've got exactly this strain. It's a new strain. It's tied to this, and it comes from this place. And that traceability and that degree of accuracy can happen across ice cream, black pepper, ground beef, tomatoes, spinach. And that's going to change the game in a fundamental way. Because right now you can't do that, which is why you get headlines that look like this, which is why you've got all kinds of people that have been wiped out by this. Why people remember the name Jack in the Box, why people remember spinach, why people remember peanut butter, why people remember specific farms. But of course, if you've got traceability, that changes imports. It doesn't tar an entire industry with one person's mistake. It's identifiable, and it's identifiable before you ship, which is why the FDA and the CDC and a bunch of other people are pushing this technology or other technologies that are taking this traceability down from days to hours. And that's coming fast. That's coming in the next year or two as you go through these systems. It means you can begin to play with traceability. It also means you can play around with microbial community. If this microbial community fixes nitrogen faster than this, these are the kinds of microbes you need here. If this kind of microbial community gives you certain immunity to these kinds of diseases or allows you to gain weight faster, here's what you can do. And it, of course, also allows you to see freshness. So before you ship, you know what the freshness is going to be on these things. So these are technology changes that are moving reasonably quickly, and they're important in the United States because this is where most jobs come from. It's stuff that all of you are going to invent. It's 0.2% of the US economy invested. It's 11% of US jobs. It's 21% of US economic output that come out of startup companies. So that's where I'm going to stop. And I am happy to take any questions, rebuttals, accusations, whatever you would like to do or discuss, and let's chat about whatever you want. Thank you. Don't wait for a mic, just shout out. Shoot. So the question is on synthetic biology, how, how large a bacteria can you make? So one of the things that we are making now, the, um, the strands of ATCGs tend to be very small and very expensive when, when you want to make them. And that's part of the reason why you've got legions of poor graduate students at 3 in the morning pipetting to assemble these things. We are now able to make very, very large scale oligos. So the way the synthetic bacteria was made is we started ordering pieces that were 100 KB long, so 100 letters long. And then we would assemble them into 1,000. And then it would look like a March Madness bracket, where you would have to bring together you know, all these things into one very long strand. So the one you saw up there was probably about 100,000 letters. And it delayed us for eight months, because we hadn't figured out that one of those was wrong. So we had to go remake all these things. Now we can do it in an automated fashion, and now we can make close to a full chromosome. So we're making and shipping the largest oligos in the United States today. All the stuff that's made by one of the largest companies all comes out of our labs, and it's automatically assembled because a guy called Dan Gibson created a Gibson assembly method, which is becoming a standard 
thing, and I think it'll have the same impact as PCR. So it's, it's, it, this is scaling fast. Other questions? We understand species and agriculture. We've got lots of products, commodities that we grow, and so we have a belief that we understand code and the result of code and what that means. But how, how much of the surface have we tapped with genetic code? I mean, microbes, bacteria, I mean, are, have we just scratched the surface with the code that's available, or is there? So you're, you're, you're so far ahead of everybody with that question. Because that's exactly the question that I think we have to answer. I'm, I'm going to put out a book next January with Penguin that talks about the future of evolution. And that's the question I'm trying to answer. What are the elements that change code? And, and these are hard, complicated, interesting discussions. And they're very hard to have in an academic environment. Much easier to have them about animals, much ha easier to have them about plants than it is to have them about human beings. And I'll give you one example of something that somebody in a tenure track professor level would simply not ask because it would be dangerous. So we know that about 50% of intelligence is inherited. But we have yet to find a single gene that really is closely tied to that, or set of genes. So how in the world do you have the entire human genome, but you have no evidence of it in the gene code? And, and as you're beginning to ask questions like that, you know, why does one person get sick versus another person? Why, do, why is there such a differential in diseases, even though people have been exposed to the same thing? It doesn't just have to do with the ATCGs. It has to do with a whole series of other things which are parallel gene codes that are operating. Let me give you two examples. One is, it turns out that all of us are symbionts. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Basically what it means is you've got 100 times more non-human cells in your body than you have human cells. They're microbes. They live on your skin. They live inside your gut. They've co-evolved with you for ever since we've been around. And as you begin to understand those microbes, the difference between somebody becoming really obese or not obese may have to do in part with the microbial community. One of the reasons why it's harder for people who have diabetes to sometimes close sores is because the sweetness of the skin and the microbial community on the skin is slightly different in one community and the other. So now you don't have to just worry about what is the gene code itself, it's how is the gene code executing in symbiosis with all this microbiome. And then to make it even more complicated, it turns out that the way the gene code executes may be affected by how you live. So if you live under conditions of extreme stress, war, famine, attacks, you pass that on to your kids, and you may pass it on to your grandkids, and that's a third area that's just coming out called epigenetics, which, by the way, has been worked on first in plants. So the first people to see the epigenetic area and to see the whole growth of epigenetics and to figure out, hey, there's a third little layer on here were people who were plant scientists. And it took until two years ago for the National Academy to let the first panel on epigenetics come in, even though plant scientists had known this for a decade. So what you're doing, which is really interesting, is you're trying to assemble these puzzles of huge amounts of data across the human genome, the core human genome, plus the microbial community that lives side by side with genomes, plus the environment that lives side by side with humans and how our environment affects us. And, and it becomes like playing chess on five different vertical places as well as a horizontal scale. And that, that makes this stuff so interesting. Right, that's what's driving high-end computing. That's what's driving massive databases. That's what's driving Microsoft into this business, Amazon into this business, IBM into this business. It's, it's really interesting what's happening.
extremely interesting is the assumption from a business perspective that the first application of this will be in very high dollar elements but and following on with that then what kind of estimate in terms of expansion of this type of technology to the mundane what are you going to produce corn and in fact you probably don't need to produce corn but you need to produce corn starch corn protein the elements you don't need the kernel anymore yeah it's not an interesting question what what are you going to produce and, and do you need to produce you know in in oil probably the first things you're going to produce is not so much gasoline but the tertiary petrochemical derivatives so you're going to go after the plastics you're going to go after the value added expensive go through one cracking system a second cracking system a third cracking system why stop at gasoline and foods you know some of the first applications will be in stuff like astroxanthin where the costs are just very high and there's not enough or high end medicines but but these cost curves on the stuff are, are dropping so fast that the question you're asking is not a preposterous question will you start making certain derivatives of various agricultural products in a different system which of course is what we've been doing for millennia right it is more efficient to grow potatoes made by the incas in ireland and germany and make it a core part of their diet than it is to use what they were using at the time so so this is a system where it's been substituting and and i think in the measure that you have a lot of folks here who are not only understanding this they're doing the fundamental research on it some of the really interesting early indicators of what is going to happen is going to come out of departments at places like this because you are working with stuff the rest of the world is not paying a lot of attention to so when you play with kernels of corn to ask that question when you do the full maize genome here and you have the basic database for the full maize genome here when you sequence an entire herd of cattle here and nobody else has that data you may not just be answering questions about cattle you may be answering fundamental questions about how life code operates where it operates and that's the reason why you keep getting all these nobels coming out of the ag field right when you think about what susan mcclintock did with jumping genes well that was something that nobody in the medical field thought is reasonable but she was watching it when you think about where cloning came from well that came out of an ag research area at the roslin institute in ppl in scotland right and it's 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 not always the places that are fancy that have the great cocktail bars that are generating some of the most interesting breakthroughs in knowledge and you know you've got a long tradition of understanding life code that's that could be really interesting so probably everybody in the room who owns farmland in Iowa is wondering whether or not those algae farms are going to be cost effective at producing bulk carbohydrates and if so how long that's going to take so so rather than being scared of that i i would embrace it and and i'll tell you why because if you think you know you go back to the records of your great grandfather or your grandfather and what he and your grandmother were planting on those acres and you look at the choices you have today right so so farming's gotten really interesting because am i going to plant environment am i going to plant wind am i going to plant energy am i going to plant organic am i going to plant futures am i going to plant so there's so many different decisions that take that acre and allow you to play with that acre so it becomes something that you can play on the futures markets because you're very smart at that or it's something that you can play because you've gotten particularly good at this kind of crop or you've gotten particularly good at this kind of corn or you are planting corn that France won't allow its farmers to plant right so so that ability to understand and adopt technology early has increased massively the complexity of farming 
but also the choices of firm. And, and of course, that gets even more complicated because the weather's changing. And so you've got all these variables in here. So what, what ends up happening is what used to be a, a business that was a whole lot of physical work and some choices has now become still a lot of physical work plus a whole lot of really complicated choices and it becomes a knowledge business and a knowledge management business. But boy, you've got a really good educated population to make those choices. So when somebody shows up with a new technology that says, oh, by the way, you could be far more productive on this acre if you were to do this, I wouldn't bet against Iowa in any way, shape, or form. Right? The, the technology adoption rates here are really good. They're really fast. But I have to tell you, those curves really surprise me. I, out of ignorance, I had not seen them before, and I looked at them and I thought, wow, these are, these are internet adoption curves. Is there a last question? Yes, sir. Throw another one out. What do you see as the biggest barrier to this vision coming forward? It's easy to scare ourselves, and it's easy to not measure the cost of not doing something, right? So there's a whole series of reasons why you could say, oh, this scares me, or this bothers me, and there's a whole bunch of countries, including the French Supreme Court yesterday, that said even though we had approved it, we are not going to allow GMO corn in France after having gone through a decades-long process and science review committees and everything else. Okay. I am really optimistic about the world. I think, you know, all of you are going to see things that we can't begin to imagine. I talked tonight about life sciences, but I could give you a lecture about robots, or I could give you a lecture about what's going on in brain research, or I could give you a lecture about what's going on in big data management. There are so many areas that are just exploding where if you're an academic, there's entirely new fields that nobody's really been in that you can be at the forefront of because they're just being created. There's whole fields that are being collapsed. Material science field is fascinating. So material science, you used to have a glass area at MIT, you used to have a metals area at MIT, you used to have a ceramics area at MIT. Now it's just material science because it's basically how do you arrange atoms? So all of these changes provide enormous opportunities to do stuff. We are generating wealth as a world, partly due to discoveries that come out of places like this, that is unprecedented. We've taken about a fifth of humanity out of poverty, in just over a generation. Right? Just absolutely unthinkable that you wouldn't have large famines constantly in India and in China. That doesn't mean there aren't people who are hungry. That doesn't mean there's places that aren't violent, but the average incidence of violence in the world has collapsed. The average calorie intake is getting to the point where Mexico is now the most obese country in the world per capita. That is really different. Now, in the process, will we muck things up? Yes, we will. Every technology we've ever used has unintended side effects and has some bad people at the edges. But if you apply the European precautionary principle, which says, don't do anything you cannot prove doesn't hurt people. Now think about that for a second. I will only approve your technology if you can prove to me it will never hurt anybody. It sounds perfectly logical until you begin to realize there is no way you would be allowed to build a staircase or to build an electrical outlet or to sell peanuts because somebody might have an allergy. And when societies get scared and quit learning, quit inventing, they die. So the thing that really scares me is that we lose our entrepreneurial spirit, and we do have to manage risks, and we have to ask about the ethics, and we have to watch the unintended consequences, and we have to keep the bad guys under control, but you know what, on the whole, we have more opportunities than anybody has ever had in human history. This is an absolutely incredible time to be a student. 
It's an incredible time to be allowed to be playing, learning, leading a whole series of fields because everything's moving and you can be part of making it move along. So there's only two things that matter in life, okay, as you take away. It's Nike and Nissan. Just do it and enjoy the ride. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and we'd like as many of you as possible to join us next door to greet Mr. Enriquez and participate in a book signing. So please feel free to flow right next door.